Hello and welcome to the Homeless Consultant channel. My name is Paul B. I am the Homeless Consultant. Today's video is entitled, Minnesota Business is Sleazy Business. We're going to talk about what it means to be a professional in the state of Minnesota. A um, few preliminaries that are in fact pretty much related, not necessarily this one, but I should mention that as we basically bypassed spring with the stay-at-home order, it is essentially summer now. Uh, a couple days ago it got up into the mid-70s, which means in this car it is you know at least 20 degrees warmer, which puts it in the mid-90s. If the sun's out, you can add another 10-15 degrees to that. That was a miserable day. Today isn't as bad, although if I don't keep opening this to let some air in, I will still be sweating bullets. <clears throat> um, second of all, about three weeks ago I did a video about U.S. Representative Angie Craig, Democrat of Minnesota. Democrats care about poor people, you see. That's, that's what they say. Um, now, there's nothing unusual here. There aren't any legislators who've ever responded or done anything for me. But, you know, I, I spent a half hour called up, spent a half hour all that phone card explaining everything to her aide, her intern, and I listed out three specific needs that I had. And it was also meant to help all the homeless people because we have no representation in government. There are no homeless representatives. We have no civil rights, we have no human rights for in any meaningful sense. So I asked for help. And what I got back was basically a, not even a courtesy of a form letter, I just got back a couple sentences which were someone winging a form letter referring me to social services. <laughs> which is absolutely useless, that's what half of this whole channel has been about. Um, so I, in my video about three weeks ago, I showed you the letter that I wrote back to them again. And I couldn't have made it more clear and concise and succinct. And at the end, I said, I'm a professional. I expect you to be a professional as well. Please answer the questions I gave you directly and quickly. It is very important. I need this to survive. Thank you. That was about three weeks ago I posted that video, right? I have not received a response from U.S. Representative Angie Craig's office. Democrat from Minnesota. Have not received a response. That's how much they care whether I live or die. Are you going to re-elect Angie Craig? Because that's why you have somebody like that in office. Somebody voted for that person. The interesting thing is, I do get mails from Angie Craig all the time. I get junk mail, spam. See, they put me on their mailing list. So I get all of her marketing emails where she's trying to get reelected. It's interesting, though, that in those junk mails where she's talking about all the things she's doing for Minnesotans, she never bothered to mention, oh, one of the things I did was completely ignore a homeless guy who's being killed by Governor Waltz's stay-at-home order. I just ignored him and left him out to die alone. And nobody in the world's ever going to know unless I tell you here in my spam mail. She never bothered to put that in her spam mail. She just wants me to die off camera so that you never find out about it. Not very professional, is it? Almost seems kind of sleazy, the topic of today's video. Number three, today the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, one of the most corrupt and useless organizations in America, came out and said that coronavirus, quote, does not spread as easily, unquote as they originally thought it did. <laughs> Do you think? You know, uh, if you look at my videos from the very beginning, from the time that this... I mean, I did all those junk science videos, about 10 of them, almost immediately after I finished that up. I, I never really did finish it. I had about two more I wanted to add. But this coronavirus nonsense started up, and the stay-at-home order came out of nowhere, because I would never expect something unconstitutional to happen in the United States of America. It's, it's unconstitutional. It's not supposed to be allowed. Someone who tries that is supposed to go straight to prison without collecting 200. But instead, Tim Waltz collected his paycheck the last two months, and he's not in prison yet. Yet. CDC says coronavirus does not spread as easily as originally thought. I said in my original videos about coronavirus that these people had no idea what they were dealing with. They had no idea what they were talking about. 
And I knew this because I know how they operate. Okay, they react. They are not proactive. They are reactive. And just like any junk scientist, a, a legitimate scientist is concerned with the truth. That's their goal, to understand the truth. The truth would benefit all of us. Junk scientists are only controlled with, concerned with themselves. They're concerned with their impact over other people. It's a social thing, not a science thing. Okay, Their ability to control other people, to dominate other people, to dictate the terms of existence for other people, to pass legislation, direct public policy, without being elected to public office, without any accountability, as President Eisenhower warned us about. That's what junk scientists do. Okay, and the way they do that is they come right out of the gate as soon as the as soon as the gun goes. You know, someone says epidemic. Back then, it was just an epidemic. Epidemic. I, I you'll see it in one of my videos. I said the people at the CDC probably woke up from their desks and said, "Whoa, we got a hot one. Let's go, 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 go. Get the playbook. Number one, do it. Number two, get the press release ready. We'll call the media." I, that's exactly what I said in my first video on this, right? Just go back and see it for yourself. Way before the stay-at-home order was even thought of. Because that's what the CDC always does. They don't even know what they're dealing with. Their only goal is to serve themselves. And the way you do that when you're a junk scientist is you come out and authoritatively state anything. Because it doesn't matter. Who's going to challenge you? The media? This news media? <laughs> Not a chance. They're the experts. Who's going to challenge them? Even if what they say is just fundamentally, obviously stupid. Well, you could look around with your eyes and you could actually see the world that you live in and figure out, hey, this thing isn't quite as, as contagious as they're saying it is. The proof is in the fact that most people don't get it. And, in fact, even if you did get it, most of them don't die from it anyway. Now, I can't get into numbers and all that, but you might want to do a little bit of math. There's, what, one and a half million people in America who've had coronavirus that they say have had it. There's no way to prove whether that's true or not. It could be half that amount. It could be twice. Who knows? You can't trust their numbers in any way, shape, or form. But if you say a million and a half, do some math and figure out how much in the American population that is. And then go to the five million in the world who have had it and compare that to 7.6 billion people. Do the math and see whether all of this was justified. Because you're, you're not talking about all the stars in the sky being the number of people in the world and only one star has coronavirus. You're talking about all the stars in the sky being all the people in the world and one photon from one star is the number of people who've had coronavirus. And yet they shut down the entire planet for that one photon. That's the threat that we've been faced with. And that's why the CDC suddenly comes out and changes their tune again, because they're always changing it, because they never knew what they were talking about in the first place. And nobody should have been following their orders, such as Governor Tim Waltz of Minnesota, who blindly obeyed them like a chained dog. Number four, there was a letter sent to President Trump signed by hundreds of doctors hundreds. Doctors, such as the ones that Governor Tim Waltz in his tweets keeps praising as heroes, as experts. Look at my video, Tim Waltz exposes himself. He's in there just praising to high heaven doctors, nurses. Hundreds of those people who he himself praised wrote a letter to President Trump. What did they say in that letter? Well, they said that the government shutdowns will create a quote Mash, mass casualty incident. The shutdowns, not the virus. Remember what I just told you about the virus? One photon from one star out of the whole sky is how much it's affected the population of this planet for, for innumerate people in case you're trying to figure out, trying to get a sense of how many people have been affected by this. Almost nobody, effectively nobody has been affected by it. Okay, now the people who are affected, yes, I understand. It's a very personal thing. People who've had family members die from it, it's terrible. But people die every day. A whole bunch of people die every single day from all kinds of causes. You can't shut down a planet because of that. And you can't shut down a state because of it. 
These doctors say that the government shut down this idiotic response that I have been telling you about from day one, how idiotic it really is. They say it's going to constitute a, quote, mass casualty incident. Why? Well, they listed out several things. For one thing, patients are missing their routine checkups. So they're not, no one's catching heart disease. No one's catching diabetes, cancer, other serious health issues that they might have. Well, if they don't catch them, they could pass the point of no return to where they're going to die later and they could have been saved or they might just die in the meantime. I've said it all along in my videos, haven't I? Increase in alcohol and substance abuse. I have said it over and over and over again in my videos. I even showed you a time lapse of a liquor store. I was there for about an hour doing a time lapse. The thing was, I mean, what is busier than that? It looked like, it looked like the Indy 500. It's supposed to be a shutdown. Everyone's supposed to be locked down at home, and this place has just got... Because Governor Tim Waltz deemed alcohol stores, booze stores, mind-altering drug stores to be essential, whereas I can't work for a living. Okay? So they're saying the increase in alcohol abuse and substance abuse. Wasn't it my very first videos on coronavirus where I pointed out that A, many people were ignoring this stay-at-home order, period, and B because there were fewer people out there, the proportions of these gang bangers, this, these trashy gang bangers and the drug dealers who deal with them was so much higher than usual. I was seeing drug deals all over the place. Well, if all these people are stuck staying at home, but they still have to get their opioids, they have to get their meth, they have to get their heroin, they have to get their pot, they have to get their mind-altering drugs to escape the world because they can't handle it. That's why I was seeing all these drug deals. I pointed it out. Go look at my videos. It's right there from two months ago. Very first thing I pointed out on the ground out here being stuck outside, I was reporting to you what I was seeing. I think I think I even filmed one. Wasn't that during the coronavirus, that, that, that one drug deal I showed you? All right. Financial instability leading to poverty, which, and this is the doctor's own words, poverty, which, quote, is closely linked to poor health, unquote. In other words, poverty, losing money, the financial instability, the very things that the stay-at-home order has done to people causes poor health. It's linked to poor health anyway. I have demonstrated for you how my health has gone straight down the toilet since I've been stuck sitting in this seat for two months. Before that, what, for 30 years I haven't been sick. Fortunately, I still haven't been sick. But as you're going to see, I'm suffering big time. You're going to see that toward the end of this video. Since I stopped using our corrupt health care system about 30 years ago, I never got sick again. Before that, I got the flu every year. I got all these illnesses. If I went into a room with contagious people, I got whatever they had. Never happened again once I stopped using our health care system. Once I took responsibility for my own health. All right? But poverty is linked to poor health. There's so much stress that comes with that. Your immune system is key. It is absolutely key. And your immune system can't function when it's under that magnitude of stress. The kind of stress where someone's coming up and sticking a loaded gun to your head and saying, you can't work for a living. You can't earn the money that you have to have to survive, according to the law of supply and demand. You can't feed your own family. Do you have any idea how stressful that is? What else could that happen other than poor health coming from poverty? These are what the doctors are saying. Not me. I, I said it earlier. I said it before the doctors did. Quote, from these doctors, quote, the downstream health effects, ellipses, are being massively underestimated and underreported. This is an order of magnitude error. Unquote. Okay, massively underreported. Haven't I said all along that this corrupt news media in Minnesota refuses to tell the truth? It omits the truth. It tells lies. It implies de deceiving, you know, deceptions. It uses all kinds of clever things, but one thing it doesn't do is just come out and tell the truth, tell the truth, tell the truth, tell the whole truth, the whole truth. It doesn't do that. It completely ignores very important things, like the effect on me and 20,000 homeless people in Minnesota. And they just lie. They get that little counter going. They don't even bother to tell you, oh, by the way, this counter means nothing. They're just making these numbers off the top of their head. Every agency that collects these numbers, they're all over the place. All right. 
Now, and they also said it was an order of magnitude error. The downstream health effects, in other words, what's going to come after the fact, what we're in for in the future. My very last video, my most, most recent video, Governor, George, Governor Tim Waltz versus Georgia Tan. Right in there among other videos, but my earlier videos had it as well. I said that the effects of this shutdown order are going to be felt probably for at least a generation, possibly even more. And it's going to be bad, bad effects. Downstream effects, massively underestimated, underreported, and an order of magnitude error. In at least two of my videos I can think of, I have used that phrase, or some very close variant, order of magnitude. These are doctors. They're coming out on May 21st and saying this. I was saying it on March, what, 26th, 27th, 28th, in that neighborhood. I mean, nothing else could happen. All you need is common sense. You need to stop smoking pot, playing video games long enough to learn some history. Because history repeats itself if you don't learn from it. And just think about it. Do some observing and think about it. I'm not some super genius. I'm just doing what a human being should do if they want to know the truth. That's all. You could do it too. Starting right now. Right now, you could do it. Here's another quote from these doctors. Hundreds of doctors who signed their name, their professional credibility on the line. Quote, the millions, millions of casualties of a continued shutdown, not of a virus, but of a continued shutdown, will be hiding in plain sight. You know, kind of like hiding in plain sight in this car, as I've said all along. But they will be called alcoholism, homelessness, suicide, heart attack, stroke, or kidney failure. In young people, it will be called financial instability, unemployment, despair, drug addiction, unplanned pregnancy, poverty, and abuse." Unquote. Those are the doctors, the people that Governor Tim Waltz himself praises to high heaven as experts and heroes. He has nothing to say about the homeless. He has nothing to say about me, even though I've been saying the same thing here for, what, a couple months now? And frankly, I said it back in my junk science videos, going back six months or so. But I don't care. I'm not in this for praise. I'm in here to try to save our country from disaster. Now, I need to add something in here. When it comes to the way that they've been cooking the books on these numbers and pretending that they know something that they don't know, and the way that the media is complicit in this lie from the CDC and the World Health Organization and all these other corrupt, I mean, my gosh, I mean, you got, you got some organizations in here that have been on my radar for so long. Uh, that Johns Hopkins, uh, um, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, for God's sakes. Oh, my goodness. Let me give you an idea of the kind of scam they're running here. Now, you know, I've talked about anti-smoking a lot because it's the one I'm most familiar with, and, and it's the granddaddy of all this. It's the one that formulated the playbook. Remember when I said the CDC? When, as soon as they mentioned coronavirus, they all woke up and, oh, get, get going, get the playbook, get the playbook. The playbook. That was written by anti-smokers. The playbook. Start at number one. Go to number two. Follow it. Just like the climate change people did. All right? Let me give you an example of what that's all about. Back sometime after Minnesota had their smoking ban in 2007, I don't remember exactly when, it might have been several years later, I'm sorry, my stuff's in storage. I believe it was North Dakota, I'm pretty sure it was North Dakota because I think it was Fargo that was here. One of these most well-known, prolific junk scientists of all, really one of the very biggest leaders of the anti-smoking fraud, just horrific I don't even want to go to what, what the kind of person this is. But this is typical of his science. And if you understand that, you're going to understand what I'm talking about when I tell you how bad anti-smoking science really is and how obvious it is. After North Dakota put in their smoking ban, this guy came out about a month and a half or two months later with a scientific study. I'm sure it was funded by you, by the way. Um, a scientific study, the mass media took it and ran with it. What was it? He said, 
he said that after the smoking ban in North Dakota, heart attacks in hospital, hospital reports of heart attacks, straight down. All right. So the media went out there, like the Minnesota news media. I mean, that's where I first saw it, right? They didn't bother to investigate it. They didn't bother to validate it. They didn't bother to see if it was true or if it was legitimate at all. It fit in with their agenda, so they ran with it because they're very anti-smoking, right? I mean, the master tobacco settlement and all that nonsense started in many ways in Minnesota. They've been among the very worst, which you would expect because Minnesota cult is a very mean-spirited cult and anti-smoking is a hate group, so it makes perfect sense. This guy came out with a study about a month or two after the smoking ban. I don't even think this was peer-reviewed. I mean, this is just science by press release. Nobody even verifies anything that he said. But they published it all across the country. What was the headline? Smoking bans reduce heart attacks. Study shows. Look at my video called Experts Warn. How the media uses these clever ways of phrasing things to make it sound like they're telling the truth when in fact they're telling a complete lie. I have seven views on that video. It's one of the most important videos I've ever put on this channel. Experts warn. Once you go through that, if you go through that whole video, you're going to start seeing the media in a different way. That's all it takes. You just have to be exposed to it and learn their tricks. Here's what he did. He came out and he said, here's the one month after North Dakota had their smoking ban. There's the heart attack rates. As soon as the smoking ban went into effect, okay, and then he went and published his his paper. And I think he, I'm not positive. I think he published it in Tobacco Control. And as I said in my junk science videos, if you have a journal that's called Tobacco Control, the odds of it coming up with results that say maybe uh, tobacco doesn't need to be controlled is really close to zero, because the agenda of these junk scientists is in the title of the journal. The journal's called Tobacco Control. It's not called Seeking the Truth about a possible relationship between smoking and health. It's called Tobacco Control. We assume that there's a real drug relationship. Alright, so this is, what, and this is the kind of chart that they would publish there. Alright, and the media ran with it. Now what they didn't do, of course, now the media's out there telling everyone, in fact, other smoking bans were passed on the basis of junk like this. All right. What they didn't do, though, was show you what happened before the smoking ban. And they didn't show you what happened after the, after, a month after the smoking ban. What happened after that? That's what happened. Up and down, up and down, up and down. They only showed you this little part here that shows you a downward trend. You see, this is called real life. This is just normal. Up and down, up and down. Sometimes there's 10 heart attacks in the hospital on a day. The next day there's two. The next day there's seven. The next day there's zero. That's the way it is. And over the course of time, the same thing is true. Sometimes you have more, sometimes you have less. Now, how many, how many states he had to go to before he finally found one where as soon as they pass a smoking ban, they just happen to be in the beginning of their downward trend for that month? I don't know. That's not science. One of the first rules of science is you need a tremendous amount of data to get valid answers. One month in a city the size of Fargo? Heart attacks, specifically? That's insanity. There's no science there. That is, that is the definition of garbage. And yet, that's what climate change people use. They don't have the data. They never will. That's the problem with climate change. They make it up. They take an ice core, which is filled with more assumptions than it has frozen water in it. Because they don't know what that ice core actually represents. They're assuming what it represents. They weren't there. That's why we can't know what's going on with climate change. But this is the thing. You see, when it comes to coronavirus, they keep posting all these numbers, and you'll see things like they talk about, um, uh, what do you call it, flattening the curve. And I hear people out there, I hear the masses out there going, oh, we got to flatten the curve. They don't even know what they're talking about. They, they think that means taking, you know, a whole bunch of coronavirus cases and bringing it down, you know, or as it's rising, the number of cases to bring it down to where there's fewer cases. That's not what flattening the curve even is. 
flattening the curve is doesn't affect the number of cases of coronavirus. What it does is it tries to, it, it takes this normal life, this is just the way life is, up and down, up and down. And it tries to get it so that you have the same number of cases, but they're a little more moderate like this and stable, the number of them. By doing that, they're trying not to overwhelm hospitals by having these big crests while, you know, I mean, you're going to have a few more than usual, but if you can try to flatten it getting in the middle here, you're not going to overwhelm the hospitals. And of course, as it turns out, the hospitals aren't overwhelmed at all. They're laying off doctors and nurses because they have nothing to do because this is a health scare, not a health crisis, as I have said from day one. You see, it's all, tie it's all the same thing. It's the same playbook. This is the same thing the anti-smokers do. Same thing. All right, I lost my mouse. All right, now I want to add something because there's there's actually something that these doctors left out of their message to President Trump. It's what I put in my video called Minnesota, the key to understanding the coronavirus phenomenon. And it is a phenomenon. Classic, classic mass hysteria. Classic. Will be studied till the end of time. Classic. People getting scared out of their wits for nothing. Um, what they left out of that was what we have done to the next generation. In my video, Minnesota, the key to understanding the coronavirus phenomenon, I specified not just all the things that the doctors just listed here, but I had others. By example, these irresponsible adults in Minnesota who are coward in fear and just, oh, please protect us. They're even putting tweets in there saying, thank you, governor, for protecting us. These are grown adults. These, supposedly, these are grown adults saying, thank you for protecting us. They're, they're so incompetent at just being a human being that they can't even protect themselves. I mean, I understand it. If if there's incoming missiles from China, you can't stop it. Sometimes the th what's happening to you is overwhelming and you need something. You need something that is specifically set up to stop that, to protect you. That does happen. In fact, that's one of the very few reasons that our federal government exists. But this wasn't a nuclear attack. This was just another disease. Wasn't really that big of a deal. I mean, it's big to the people who lose someone in it, but you know what? Somebody lose someone to flu, someone loses someone to all these different things all the time. I'm sorry anyone's dying from it, but people die all the time. It's life. But the example that these adults set for their children, by example, right in front of their eyes, was to live in fear instead of to live with courage. To abdicate your responsibilities to government. It's no longer your responsibility to take care of yourself and your family. Now it's up to government to do it for you. You don't need an education. If something comes along that's more important, just put it off indefinitely. Not a big deal. If something's more important, you don't need that education. What good's an education? It's only going to help you, you know, things like oh, recognize when you're being scammed with a health scare. That's what an education would do for you. What do you need that for? What would you ever need something like that for? studying rhetoric and propaganda, studying things like my expert warned video so that when you read headlines you'll immediately recognize the manipulation in there just instinctively just ah manipulation Star Tribune did it again Pioneer Press did it yet again but this time they didn't get away with it because I studied it in school you see that's what an education does for you Trust the media. Do not question the media. The media tells the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. That's what the children were taught by example, by these Minnesotans. Obey and fund. Go to work at a job that actually benefits society, and then let someone come along with a gun, loaded gun and steal your money and give it to fund these experts, such as the CDC, who just came out after all these months and turned everything around and said, well, it's actually not quite as, uh, doesn't spread as easily as we thought it did. Which the homeless guy was saying a couple months ago, but whatever. Uh, and lastly, the Constitution is meaningless. What, what, the Constitution doesn't mean anything. Governor Tim Walz can just come and violate it at will. He can come and do the same thing that Nero did. 
the very reason we had a Constitution. The whole point of the Constitution was so that nobody could ever just pull a pretense out of nowhere and say, I'm the man. You can work for a living. You cannot. You get to survive and feed your family. You don't. You get to maintain your health and your body and your exercise. You have to just sit in a car for two months straight. See, that was why the Constitution was there, was so that nobody could ever do that to human beings again. But these Minnesotans don't get it, maybe because they put other things before education. For example, those who do not learn from history are doomed to repeat it. But even these doctors didn't mention all that. These are casualties. If they're talking about millions of casualties, as in millions of death, deaths coming from directly from these stay-at-home orders, what about what's going to happen to the next generation? My last video, the most recent video I put up there, um, Governor Tim Waltz versus Georgia Tan. I tell how the government's same response as what he did more than a hundred years ago with the yellow fever epidemic ended up not only destroying their economy and their city to where the city lost their charter, city of Memphis, Tennessee, they stopped legally being a city. They were so bankrupt. But it destroyed them for generations to come. And that's exactly what I was talking about here. It, it, it made the conditions possible for institutionalizing child trafficking as a government function. Corrupt government officials could use the power and the protection of government to traffic children. And that has continued to today, where the leading involvement in child trafficking today is our government. And it started with Georgia Tan, and she came to power because 40 years prior, people like Tim Waltz did the stupidest thing you could possibly do in the face of an epidemic or a pandemic. He did the same thing they did. One doctor gave an example, a 31-year-old woman with a history of depression. She was trying to get over the depression by getting a master's degree, getting an education. The stay-at-home order stopped her from pursuing that, didn't it? She couldn't do that anymore. So the depression took over. What happened? She overdosed on fentanyl. She died. And because of the stay-at-home order, only six people were allowed, allowed, the government, the dictator, the tyrant, allowed only six people to attend her funeral. Now, I'm not, I don't believe this happened in Minnesota, but you get my drift. This is despicable. This is so much more despicable by orders of magnitude than just letting the virus run its course even if people are going to get it and die. That's part of life. You can take reasonable precautions. I mean, I saw this woman, this old woman out there, and the old people are susceptible to the coronavirus, both to getting it and to dying from it. She had a big old mask on, and she had like a welder's shield in front of her face. If that's what it takes to protect her, she was doing it. It shouldn't be required by law, but if she wanted to survive, that's what she has to do under the circumstances. That makes sense, doesn't it? But it doesn't make sense for people who are not really susceptible to this at all and who survive it if they get it to shut them down completely and destroy their futures and their lives at least for many, many years to come as they try to recover from this. Now, also the doctors pointed out that in South Dakota where there was no lockdown, they've had almost no cases of coronavirus in the past several days almost no cases of it, no lockdown, and yet it was just a few months ago, I'm sorry, a few weeks ago. You remember it yourself, right? You remember. You remember hearing it. You remember seeing it. You remember seeing the media, this media that lies and deceives, just a few weeks ago saying that South Dakota was, quote, a hotbed of coronavirus. It was a hot spot, right? You remember hearing it. If you don't, just... Google it. Look it up. That's what the media told you. Because they didn't want anybody avoiding a lockdown. Because when you do the right thing, by contrast, it exposes the people who are doing the wrong thing. More people died from coronavirus in Minnesota because of the stay-at-home order than would have happened otherwise. I'm very confident of that. And I think the numbers are finally starting to bear it out. And it is just a crying shame that that's what it took. 
for people to figure that out. Having said that, let me move on to the main topic of this video. Minnesota business is sleazy business. This is about professionalism. Remember, when I, the reason this is called the Homeless Consultant Channel, if you, look, if, you, if you can make your way back 150 videos when I started this, it was about business. Something that I'm pretty good at and I know very well. And I was using my experience of homelessness as the, um, you know, the it was a it was a very unique way to look at business from this perspective. And sometimes when you look at things you want to learn from a different perspective, it helps you to learn it. Um, calculus was that way with me. When I first encountered calculus, the teacher wasn't very good. I couldn't get it. Then I got another teacher, and they showed it to me in a whole different context. And all of a sudden, oh my gosh, that is so cool. Right? And that's what I was trying to do with the Homeless Consultant channel. Um, lately, and well, throughout my videos, throughout my, all my videos, but especially lately, I have I've repeated that it is impossible to make wise decisions, good decisions that benefit you, if you do not have accurate, complete, and sufficient information. You have to have that. If people are lying to you, if they're supplying disinformation or misinformation, I mean, how do you run a military, a military defense of a nation, if what you're basing all of your decisions on is foreign spies and double agents who are feeding misinformation to you? Aren't you going to do the opposite of what you should be doing and set yourself up for disaster? You can't do it that way. The problem I've had in Minnesota from the beginning, again, is that Minnesota operates as a cult. Minnesota nice is just some slang term that describes this cult that these people can't even comprehend. One aspect of this cult is that they are very passive aggressive. They try to avoid direct confrontations. Instead, they do things, they, they hurt you from a distance. They're snipers, cowards. And this passive aggressiveness manifests itself in many ways by just lying all the time, starting with representing who they are to you. You don't know who this Minnesotan is. You can spend, you can work with them for years and you will not know who this person really is because you're only seeing the facade that they put up, which is what cult members do. Because deep down inside, people in a cult know they're in a cult and they don't, you know, it depends what you're going for. I mean, there are some cults, eh, that's probably not a good example. There are some cults out there that blatantly, you know, Jehovah Witnesses, you know, there are some out there that are very proud of what they do. But the, the more sinister cults, the one, the more sinister cults are the ones that you don't know they're a cult until it's too late. All right. And those are the ones who come out there and they try to present themselves as if they were normal because it sucks you in. And by the time you figure out what they really are, it's too late. You know, that's something like what Scientology would do or that uh, Kansas City Church of Christ, that kind of thing. Minnesotans lie. They misrepresent who they are and they don't tell you the truth. They omit the truth. They omit relevant facts. That is why I've had so, such a difficult time making good decisions since I've been here. Because I don't have any accurate information to work with. My landlord, it's his job. I paid him $60,000. It's his job to enforce the lease that he wrote and he required me and my neighbors to sign. And he said he's going to do something about it, but then he just did absolutely nothing. Didn't even try. See, he lied. But for how many months was that that I was depending on him to do his job? Throughout those months, I'm being abused and tortured and tormented by my neighbors. The trauma is taking over more and more over those months. And at some point, I have to figure out, this landlord's a liar. He, he said he was going to do something, but he's doing nothing. Then I go to the police, and I get the exact same thing. As, as the time progresses between when they say, the police chief in this town, he came up to me because I, I caught him on camera get him on camera he said call us the next time this happens and quote it will stop that's what he said it will stop so the next time it happened I called up the police and what did they do I had the recording of it the guy said why don't you just move away nothing about stopping the criminals the ones who are breaking the law breaking their lease terrorizing their neighbor why don't you move away that's not the same thing as it will stop is it? So I can just move away to another place where they also don't enforce the noise laws and you have the same problem all over again? That makes no rational sense. You see, 
there was no way to make it through that. And at the same time as I'm dealing with those neighbors, the medical device company I worked for did the same thing. Now, it was an international company. They were in Minnesota. The headquarters is here, but they're international. So they had a president who was from another country. This guy was a square dealer. Okay, he said what he meant. He meant what he said. Even I could go in and talk to him, and he would be honest with me. Doesn't mean he's going to tell me every trade secret or something, but I could work with the guy. Okay, when he moved on, they brought in a new president. This one was a Minnesotan. And from day one, this guy lied through his teeth. He told lies. He misrepresented what he was going to do. And specifically, they promised everyone, your jobs are safe. All right, just focus on your work. You're fine. This is just a new person. Don't worry about it. Everything's fine. Your jobs are safe. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, I'll go into work on Wednesday like any other day, and they're actually at the door waiting for me. And they had taken all my coworkers and taken them away to a meeting to tell them that they were firing all these people, including me. Some of their best employees. Just getting rid of them. Because some guy who didn't even understand how our company worked, on paper, thought in his brilliance that getting rid of these particular nameless, faceless names is going to benefit the company. Of course, doing that not only to help destroy my life, that's what contributed to me becoming homeless, but it destroyed, it, well, it didn't destroy, but it started to hurt their company. He was gone within a year. This guy was pathetic. In part because he's a Minnesotan. He lies, he deceives, he wasn't trustworthy. But even as he's hurting the company so bad, he jumped out of that crashing plane with a golden parachute, millions of dollars. He's just fine. It's only other people who have to be destroyed. The people he let go were some of the best people that company had. They were some of the people who made that such a good company, such a respected company. <clears throat> Now, when that kind of thing's going on, you can't make good decisions. When they're telling me your job's safe, don't worry, then I have to balance what's going on in my home life where I'm curled up in a ball in the fetal position with these terrorizing neighbors. But at least in my mind, based on the other years I had worked there where I worked with a president who was from another country who told the truth, if he said your job's safe, then my job's safe. If he says, to be honest, we're considering, we're looking at options, there could be changes coming up, or there could be something that affects you, then I kind of know, hey, there might be something down the pike. But not, not this Minnesota, this Minnesota president. Nope, oh, everything's fine, your, your, your job's safe, just you know, focus on your work, we got to make money. And with that in mind... Let me point out that the company I work for now, that I've worked for for the last three years, now I've said in my last few videos that I'm, um, it's part of a strategy to work there. It, it's it's kind of complicated, but um, there are some real benefits to working there versus someone else, somewhere else. Um, in terms of what I'm trying to do, trying to get out of homelessness in another state in a position of strength. Okay, and what that position of strength is, is for me to know and you to find out, but that's how this is relevant. Okay, this job is better suited toward getting me to that position than pretty much any other job I would be getting. Now, one problem with that is that this company, now they, they are based outside of Minnesota, they're from another state, but the people who actually run it here are Minnesotans. And for that reason, I have had to deal with ethical and moral issues that are absolutely overwhelming. If, if I had any ability, I would have left this job a long time ago because the ethics here is just stomach churning. Now there's a lot of other good things. I work with some really wonderful people. I mean, some of the most fun I've ever had working in a place with other people. There are some just great and wonderful people I work with. Um, what I'm able to do for other people in my capacity is so satisfying. It makes me feel so good and to see the effect, it, the positive effect it has on their lives is such a wonderful thing. But the magnitude of ethical violations, just fundamental human decency violations that this company pulls. Not the company based in another state, but the operators here in Minnesota, the Minnesotans who run it. 
has made my stomach turn all along. And I've had to deal with that. It has been a really difficult battle for me. But I've dealt with it because I know I was working my way out of it. I was doing what I need to do now and move on if things hadn't happened like Governor Waltz's stay-at-home order, which killed the whole thing. Now, having said that, last Friday, which was May 15th, last Friday, May 15th, middle of the month, middle of the month of May, right smack in the middle, I'm contacted by my employer, and they said, the stay-at-home order is expiring, we're going back to work. We want you to go back to work, your regular schedule, next week, starting on Tuesday, the 19th. Unfortunately, as my schedule is, I work Thursday through Monday. So that meant I was going to start on Thursday the 21st. Remember, it was the 15th when they contacted me. That means it was one week later when I was going to start working. They told me on Friday it was next Thursday I was going to start working. That means I'm not going to get a one day or two days of work on a paycheck that week. No check there. That means that at best I'm going to get one check on the 27th. It would be a full week's check, but it would be just one check. And that's it for the month of May, period. And remember, they're telling me this in the middle of May. So I'm really excited and gung-ho about getting back to work for Friday and for Saturday and for Sunday and for Monday I'm just pleased anxious just oh my gosh I can't wait to get back to work and for Tuesday but on Tuesday I did something else because you know for almost two months I have not been able to shower shave do anything eat nutri cook nutritious food sleep in a bed I, all these things I haven't been able to do And I have a ton of bills to pay. Just a ton. I've paid them up till now, but now they're starting to default. I've already lost things permanently, like my post office box. It's gone forever. I can't get another one because you have to have a permanent resident address to get a P.O. box. I can't just go renew it. It's gone. I do not have a P.O. box anymore. No way for someone to mail me again. All right? So when I, I, went, I ran the numbers throughout those four or five days, and I ran them over and over and over, and I thought about it long and hard, and I made a decision, and it was a good one, I think. I took most of the big stuff that I had. Remember, one, one thing I've done throughout this is to replace the recording studio that I had in my home. Okay, because right now I can do that. If I'm not spending all the money on rent and all that, I can do that. So over time, I've accumulated things that I need to, for that recording studio. Because when it comes to getting out in a position of strength, that's what I want to do. I want to get back to doing things like making wedding videos and, and all the different audiovisual things that I do. That's why I spent years, really, about seven years building that studio that I never got to use in my home before I lost the home. So I was building back the essential core components, the, the, the gear and technology I need for that. I took all those items, the, the major ones, six, of, six items, I took them down to a pawn shop. Now, those things cost me about $2,000 total over the last three years, about $2,000. I got $500 for them. Now, well, I'm sorry, $560, okay? So I get $100 for each of all these and then 60 on the other. And I had them do it on separate tickets. The reason is because by the way I'm calculating the numbers, I was going to be able to buy those things back. I was going to be able to get most of them in the month of June, and then possibly a couple others would have to wait till August. But I would get them back. With that money... That gave me enough money to pay the essential bills I have to pay right now. My storage bill here. Um, I can't remember what they all are. It did not allow me to renew the tags on my car, but I can't do that anyway because the big problem there hasn't been money. It's that I can't walk into the place to get the tags. They can't mail them to me. Especially now that I don't have a P.O. box. But you can't, you can't mail it to a home address I don't have. So that allowed me to pay the bills there. The, the first check I was going to get on the 27th, 
would cover the remaining ones and then there was one bill that has enough of a grace period where the check after that could handle it. In other words, and then I could start paying off buying these things back from pawn. Now it's probably going to be the end of June or mid-July before I'm all done with that, but by mid-July I should be back to where I am, well, two weeks ago on the 15th, right? And that's a good thing because I need that gear if I'm going to move into what I want to do for my life, what I have been pursuing for the last 15 years or so. All right. So with that $550, I put it in the bank so that those bills would be covered. <clears throat> they wouldn't default on those. Um, and I went out and I got a hotel. I got the hotel for two nights. For one thing, I needed to get my bearings back. After two months of no privacy and not even just, just living like this, I needed to be in a place where I'm by myself and I can get on my knees and pray to God and I can think about things and try to just remember how to do my job. What all the keystrokes are on the computer, I don't even remember. I'm going to have to learn how to do my job all over again. And I used to be the best one at it. I wanted to get clean. I wanted to shave. I wanted to cook some food. Something nutritious. Without paying, you know, $15 at a restaurant. So I got the hotel for two days. As soon as I got the hotel, the first thing I did was turn on that bathtub. First thing I did, I brought all the stuff in there, turned on the water. I grabbed my video camera and I stripped down. And I looked at my body for the first time in two months. The first time in two months I've been able to look at my body. And I filmed it. Because if I ever find a competent attorney, not like this loony bird that I told you about a couple videos back, this osteotheophobic loony, but if I find a competent attorney who actually cares about human rights and about the rights of homeless people, I'm going to want a video like that when I pull Governor Waltz into court. And I was horrified by what I saw. There were, there were things with my body I had no idea were going on. Just one example, I've told you about the bleeding down there, how those blood blisters get really, really big, just down there in my groin, down in my butt and everything. Huge blood blisters. You squeeze them and it just, it'll, it'll fill a little vial of, of blood. Daily. It fills my underwear, ruins all my underwear. I have to put all those bandages all over all over my body down there. Well, once those bandages come off and I'm able to get in some light and get naked where I can see what's going on, there were seven of those blood blisters. I only knew about maybe three of them. The filth in my toes. My, I mean, I don't even know how to explain it. The My body was formed, literally formed in the shape of the seat. I mean, it had... It had Bent, it had changed the, my back. It had changed my posture fundamentally. My, my belly, the way it sticks out, from having pants on tight around my waist for two months straight without ever releasing it. I was horrified by what I saw on my body. My hair when I got in there. So I filmed all that. Then I took the bath. It felt wonderful, like, well, to a degree. The problem with being in the bath was that I suddenly realized my back doesn't work anymore from sitting in this chair for so long. I couldn't get out of the bathtub. I had to, I had to do one of these things and it was, it was a nightmare just trying to get out of the bathtub. I could not lift myself out of the bathtub. My back hurt so bad. When I finally got out of there and you look at the tub, it was just absolutely filthy. Mostly skin, not so much dirt. I mean, it's not like I've been out rolling in dirt. I've been sweating and just oils and things from your body for two months straight that I can't clean. That's what it was. It was horrific. I couldn't even wash my hair. I mean, I couldn't move my body enough because this wonderful hotel, you know, I didn't want to shower because I wanted to see what was in the bath when I'm done. But anyway, my point is, I got the bath. I certainly felt a whole lot better. As soon as I was done with the bath, I put on my sandals because now it's warmer out. Instead of using the moccasins or whatever you want to call them, slippers that I wore before, I put on the sandals. And I got in the car, which felt wonderful as far as 
being clean. And I drove down to wash the car and to vacuum it because I had pulled so much stuff out and put it in the hotel, I could actually see the interior of this car instead of all the junk in here. So I vacuumed, you know, I had $550 now, so I was able to put a dollar into a vacuum, a couple bucks into the car wash, try to get the salt off. So 20, 30 minutes later, I come back to the hotel. I open the hotel door, and I'm not, I don't even know how to express this in a way that you will understand. I thought I was walking into a morgue where the heater had been turned on for the past day or so. It just smelled like, it, it was the smell of death. I thought there was a rotting corpse in there. I didn't even understand it. I didn't even understand it. It was just, it just hit me and I was like, just gagging. I finally figured out what it was. You know what it was? It was those moccasins I'd been wearing for two months in this car. That's how bad my feet smelled. All the times I'm out walking to these gas stations and everything, all the smell that I smell in here, but I'm used to it, but it still was horrible to smell. That's the main thing it was coming from. That and obviously the other area that gets dirty. When I'm walking out to a gas station or something, that's what other people had to smell. The smell of death. I grabbed those little slippers and I ran downstairs and threw them in the dumpster. And I opened the window and tried to air the place out. It was a couple hours before I could even stand it in there. And that's from, what, 20, 30 minutes of those things just sitting in there open. Well, plus the bath time. But I, I, I didn't even realize how bad it smelled until I got away for 20 or 30 minutes and then came back. It was the smell of death. And that's what my feet look like, too. When I finally laid down in the bed, it hurt so bad. It was just nothing but pain. My back, because my back is formed in the shape of this seat with this iron bar sticking into my side. I couldn't, I couldn't, and those are really comfortable beds. I will say that about this place. Very comfortable beds. I couldn't get comfortable at all. It just hurt. It was just like... It was like someone's just bending your back. I had to basically turn on my side in the fetal position, which is the closest thing to the shape of my body sitting in this seat. It wasn't that much fun in that hotel room, to be honest. And as time went on, I couldn't walk. I would stand up and I would just like fall down to my, you know, almost to my knees because my back would give out. And I could barely walk. I'm just taking these short steps and it just every bone in my body hurts because I haven't used these muscles in two months just simple muscles you know the kind of muscles you use to brush your teeth with for example it hurts so bad being in that hotel so I'm in there that's what I'm doing <clears throat> and I started doing my thing I'm trying to remember how to work of one of the first things I did get down and thank God That was Tuesday I went in there. On Wednesday at 4.30 p.m. in the afternoon. Okay, that's less than, tw less than 24 hours, way less than 24 hours before I'm supposed to go into work. I get contacted by my employer and they say, there's been a delay in opening the business, opening the office. Don't come into work tomorrow. We'll tell you when we're going to open. And I texted him back and I said, that is absolutely catastrophic to me. I need to know when we're going to open. And they just wrote back and said, we'll let you know later. I, I don't know. If I, if, I, if I can film the text, I'll just show you the text outright. I made the decision to take $2,000 worth of stuff and to get $560 for it. I made that decision after about four days of careful thought, running the numbers over and over, looking for anything I was missing. And the only thing I could think of I was missing was, well, what if they don't open up again? But I can't think of why they wouldn't. It would, if, they, if that happens, that's because of Tim Waltz, right? But I think what's going on here is they're realizing, well, if we open the office, it's only for Paul. He's the only person who can't work from home. 
do we really want to open an off an entire office just for him now when it was open already and I was the only person there so what they could have just continued it on but after two months they're probably thinking do we really want to pay the electricity and the security issues liability potential all this stuff just to have one person working there and instead of telling me when I'm gonna be able to work now they're telling me we'll let you know but they can't even tell me when they're gonna let me know remember they first told me about this on the 15th of May the very middle the midpoint of the month of May now because of this I can't get a check until June at the earliest that means I can't pay any of those bills and all the things I had that were worth enough money where I could sell them to pay those bills are sitting in a pawn shop right now because I took only a hundred dollars for each one so that I could get it back because I need that stuff back see the company gave me bad information they lied now when I'm working for that company if they tell me to do something they expect me to get it done and if I tell them I'm gonna do something I'm gonna call them you want me there at this time you want me to come in for overtime I will be there they expect me to be there because I said I was gonna be there and I'm a professional and guess what I'm always there if they tell me to do something I say yes I'll get this done and I get it done if I tell them I need to do this I'm gonna work on this and maybe even I'll have it done by such and such time guess what that's what happens it's called being a professional and if I blew it in one of those cases it isn't really the end of the world anyway for the company look at what they're doing though they say on Friday come in and start working your regular shift next week all right and then they wait all the way a whole week until right before the day, night before I'm supposed to go in and they tell me uh, never mind you're not going into work we don't have any idea when you're gonna we'll let you know so I just took all the things I had that could have given me a prayer of a hope of paying my bills and they're gone they're sitting there in a pawn shop right now I can't get any more money out of those and now no matter what when I start working I will not have enough money to pay all my bills including my storage in California where every single thing I have to remember my family by is my car insurance will expire I'm a month behind on that already and that's all you get after the 31st they cancel my car insurance it's gone just like my tags are gone wouldn't have happened if the company had kept their word now remember this company is operated locally by Minnesotans what did I say about Minnesotans they lie you can't rely on anything they tell you when you try to make decisions based on what they tell you more often than not you're gonna get burned this is a catastrophic burn folks and they can't after they had two months to figure out how to get this thing open for one employee it's not like there's a bunch of us running around and you've got a social distance and all that. One person! And they can't figure out how to open it after two months of having to be able to plan something like that. And they can't even tell me when they're going to know after they just told me to be at work now. I should have been at work two hours ago. That's when I should have been going into work. And instead, I'm back here. Now let's say they call me into work and I start working next week. Guess what? I can't go to a hotel right before then. So I'm not going to have that sleep. I'm not going to have that food. I'm not going to have a shower. And my hair is just going to grow back as far as the facial hair. So instead of going in nice and clean and presentable and professional looking like I plan to today, I can't do that whenever it is they're going to have me back in there. Is it something I did wrong? Okay, I make the best decisions I can based on the available evidence. But they lied. That is not very professional, but that is par for the course for Minnesota businesses. Because Minnesota business is a sleazy business. Just like this medical device company when a Minnesotan took it over. When the international president was here, that kind of thing didn't happen. See, this, this just makes my point. You can't you can't do anything you, you, you can't you can't function in this society 
You, you can't do it. If you're an outsider, if you're a transplant, if you're used to the rest of the world where pe most people keep their words, certainly in the professional world, people don't remain in the professional world if they're a bunch of liars. You, you can't have attorneys who act like that. A homeless person calls him up for help and he just reams them a new one, basically does something so disgusting that he almost deserves to be sued himself for what he did. The trauma that that guy gave me. I mean, that doesn't happen in other places. At least, I haven't seen it. I'm not going to say it doesn't happen somewhere, of course. <laughs> there's, there's, it's not like Minnesota's this box where only these things happen here and not elsewhere. But Minnesota functions in a way that is fundamentally different than the rest of the country. By the way, when I was at the pawn shop, I talked to the owner of the pawn shop, and he told me that they were able to be open throughout the entire stay-at-home order because they're technically a financial institution. They give loans, right? So I got talking to him, and I said, well, how did that go? I mean, I bet you everyone just probably sold you everything they had, right? And he's like, no. He said, I don't, almost nobody's selling us anything. He said, everybody's making so much money off of unemployment and stimulus, they're making more than they ever did at a job. They've been in here just buying stuff left and right. I can, hard, I can hardly keep up anything to sell them. I thought the stimulus was to help these people survive and to pay their bills and to take care of their families and to save up in case there's an emergency unexpected. I thought that's what that was for. But they're out there just buying lawnmowers and big TVs and stuff like that at a pawn shop? Maybe that helps to explain why these Minnesotans on Twitter are so thankful to Governor Waltz for protecting us and saving us. Because they get to stay home and play video games and smoke pot and go out and shop with all this free money they're getting from the government. While someone like me sitting in this car has got nothing. No unemployment, no stimulus, nothing. All I am ended up doing is losing everything I worked the last three years to earn. And then some. If I lose everything that I have to remember my family by. As I said, this company I work for, as many positives as there are there, that one negative is a really big negative. Their ethics is non-existent. They are sleazy in the extreme. And it, I have to hold my stomach every time I'm there working. Now you can see why. Who does that to somebody? Their best employee, one of their very first employees when they opened up with the longest tenure, best performance reviews. I have been nothing but loyal and faithful and good for that company. And what do they do? They let me go two months without any income and then they pull a stunt like that on me. Me, not the other 99 people I work with. Me. Incredibly sleazy. Only in Minnesota is something that horrific going to happen. They can't give me any reason why. They can't even tell me when this is going to be remedied. They can't tell me when the date's going to come when they tell me that then I can start working at some point in the future. And the whole reason is probably because they care so little about me as a human being, as a valued employee, that they would rather keep the office closed and save a little money on air conditioning than allow me to have a life worth living. And to benefit their customers, because that's what I do. I do things for their customers that others don't do. They don't even care about their customers in that sense. You try that with your employee. You try, you try telling them, yeah, I'll be there, uh, I'll be there on Thursday at 11 to, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll get this problem taken care of for you. And you call up at 9 in the morning and say, you know what, I, ah, I'm not going to do this. I, you know, I know you needed this. I know that your, I know your customers were waiting on this project and it's a big contract, but, uh, you know, I'm just, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to tell you why either. What I will do though is I will contact you in the future and at that point in time I will tell you when I'm going to come in and do this. Um, unless of course I'm lying again. If you tried that with your employer, wouldn't you be out the door in no time? Why isn't it the other way around? The employer can do that to me. One of my 50 greatest existential threats to the United States of America that I never got to expand on was corporate inhumanity 
and human resources. Exactly what I'm describing here. So now I'm back in this car. I have a shower, I have a shave, the hair's already starting to grow out again, I'm already sweating in this heat, building up the stink all over again. I blew 130 bucks on that hotel for nothing. I never would have done it if I didn't know I wasn't going back to work the next day. But they waited till the last minute. Just sleazy all around. And this is all I have seen from Minnesota business in terms of big business. I'm not talking about small businesses and people running something for themselves. I'm talking about corporate, especially if they have a human resource department. Unbelievably sleazy business in this state. And with that, I am absolutely at the end of my rope. I'm going to do something I don't want to do at all. When I got the job, before I got the job, you know, I, I started this channel four or five years ago. I don't remember exactly how many. About four years ago, I think, for this particular one. I had the website before that. I would put my email address at the end and say, you know, email or PayPal me. When I got this job, I had income. I took that off. I didn't need donations anymore. I, only, I didn't want donations in the first place. I needed them to stay alive, and I really didn't get any. The biggest one I got was from someone from Sweden. <laughs> because he cared. Likewise, I couldn't really use the email anymore anyway, because all I really got, not everything, but I got so much hate mail and trolls and why don't you hurry up and die from these Minnesota cheerleaders, these sick and twisted people you see on Twitter, that I just said, I'm not even going to deal with the email anymore. What's the point? So I haven't even looked at it in three years. But I don't have a choice at this point. I have been screwed over every which way to Sunday by these Minnesotans. I can't trust a word they say. Even Waltz with a stay-at-home order, he ended up extending the dang thing. You never know what's, what's the date I can start working again. How can I start planning my life? If they had had me go back to work today, I could have actually come out of this. I would have lost some things and some pretty serious things, to be honest. Things I've already sold off and losing that P.O. box is devastating. I have no way to receive mail ever again. I got that when that family took me in and I had a resident address. You have to have one to get a P.O. box. That's gone forever. No one can mail me any more because of that. Unless I commit a felony to get a P.O. box. So I don't have a choice, folks. I'm going to try this. I don't know if there's any point to it. I'm going to put my email address up here. And I'm going to ask that if you want to doesn't have to be a lot but if you want to try to help me out I'm now accepting donations PayPal me a donation if you would like to help I would be most grateful I'm so sorry but I don't know if I can stomach the emails though I don't think I can get in there and look at those emails the the kind of hate and bile and vitriol I've gotten from these Minnesotans you just don't understand I don't see the point to it I'll leave it up to you what you want to do But I have done everything I can imagine. I have avoided taking any government assistance throughout this whole thing. Even in this period. Well, I couldn't get the stimulus anyway. But I wasn't going to sign up for unemployment. I don't want that. I want to work for a living. That's what a human being who is responsible and with dignity does. And everybody is preventing me from doing that. If you want to try to help me, I don't know. I can't promise you I'll pay you, be able to pay you back. It depends on whether I survive this. If I do and I get rolling and I get an income, I will do everything I can to make it right. But I don't want to promise anything I can't deliver. If you're okay with that and you want to help me, I would be most grateful if you would help me. I've made a lot of these videos and I'm not making them to vent, I am honestly making them to try to affect other people for the betterment of our country and even this state that has treated me so horrifically.
If you find that a valuable service, I would greatly appreciate your help. If not, I understand. And that's all I have for you today, folks. I'm back to riding in this car. I'm back to moving towards smelling like a decaying corpse. But I am very grateful to you for watching. Thank you.